Committee, and um, I, I'm also a member of the uh, Outer Banks Association of Realtors, so we're wearing two hats. And uh, we are really, really uh, happy and fortunate to be partnering with um, Outer Banks Association of Realtors for this very important uh, public forum on uh, the possibility of our homeowners wind and hail um, increase. And uh, Willow Kelly is uh, the CEO of um, Outer Banks Association of Realtors. She's also a member of League of Women Voters. Um, we're very uh, privileged um, to have her. She has been uh, the legislative uh, representative for many, many years um, of the Outer Banks Association of Realtors as well as the Home Builders Association. And so she has followed the insurance, what's happening with insurance for many, many years. And thanks to Willow and all of her efforts, we kept uh, our increases very uh, modest compared to what could, they could have been. So we want to thank her and we're very grateful for her knowledge. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go over to the podium for the presentation, but um, Fran, thank you for that wonderful introduction, but definitely a team group effort um, between all those involved with the Outer Banks Association of Realtors and the Outer Banks Home Builders, as well as the League of Women Voters on past um, forums that we've held on homeowners insurance increases, dwelling insurance increases, wind and hail, flood insurance discussions, and everything. So um, tonight we're going to focus on the 2018 homeowners insurance rate filing. And so I'm going to go over to the podium. Just keep your eye on the screen. Um, everyone should have one of these. Uh, I joked before a lot of you got here that there'll be a test at the end. <laughs> There's actually um, 10 years of research right in here that is in your hands um, that we're going to review just a little bit. But hopefully when you leave here this evening, you'll know exactly what needs to be done to try to fight these, again, double-digit, very large increases in our homeowners insurance um, rates. Uh, I think you've heard me say this in the past, if you've <clears throat> attended any of these forums, that the cost of insurance, property insurance overall, and some of us are paying four and five policies if you have to have excess coverage, etc. Um, we could have a flood policy, a homeowner fire liability policy, a wind policy, an excess flood, an excess wind. So it all adds up. But where you're paying more than your mortgage payment, you're paying more than your taxes. And the cost and the rising cost of insurance impacts the affordability of housing. Not the, the ability to buy a house, but the ability to maintain your mortgage. And for those that are affected by this homeowner's insurance rate filing, these are the people that live in our neighborhoods year round. These, uh, this rate filing does not affect dwelling policies. So we're gonna get into that. So I'm gonna walk over here to the podium and we're gonna get through this presentation. And then there won't be a quiz afterwards. So, all right, I said all that up front after I was told by Kurt over there to please speak in the microphone. And this is being um, recorded so that those that were unable to attend um, this evening will hopefully before February 26 see this and um, be able to make some comment. So, we're going to have property insurance 101 here. Um, does anyone know the relationship between the North Carolina Rate Bureau and the North Carolina Department of Insurance? Don't all speak at once. Um, the North Carolina Rate Bureau, North Carolina is one of probably about 10 or 11 states that has, first of all, an elected insurance commissioner. And then I think we are the only state that has a rate bureau. Um, or is it the other way around? No, it is. <laughs> we have what is called a rate bureau in other states insurance companies will file a rate that they want to use with the Department of Insurance within that state, and insurance is regulated by the states, and that uh, they file the rate, the insurance uh, department reviews that rate, and then there may be some other steps involved of the company to start using that rate. In North Carolina, we have a rate bureau that is collectively made up of all of the companies writing insurance in the state of North Carolina, and I think there's about between 180 and 200 at this time. So all of the underwriting companies, the companies, the admitted carriers, um, those that are writing coverage in the state of North Carolina make up the rate bureau. And there are certain rules that apply to be a part of the rate bureau. So the North Carolina Rate Bureau, of which, interestingly enough, in 1944, there was the McCarran-Ferguson Act that um, uh, it 
the insurance companies do not have to, in a sense, like realtors have to comply with antitrust. It kind of exempts them from that. And so the rate bureau operating collectively, you would think that's kind of antitrust, but it's not. The, um, the rate bureau then collectively gathers data, information on uh, loss history, on um, many different things, and we'll go over the factors in a minute. And they review where the rates are, if they're adequate, et cetera, et cetera. And then they make what's called a filing to the North Carolina Department of Insurance. Not only on property insurance, but also on automobile insurance and, and, and such. So the relationship between the North Carolina Rate Bureau and the North Carolina Department of Insurance, the North Carolina Department of Insurance is ultimately going to make the decision on the rate that can be used, the maximum rate, the manual rate that is allowed. And the North Carolina Rate Bureau um, operates as, say, one insurance company in the state of North Carolina, so to speak, um, for all of the insurance companies. So I think I've explained a rate filing. A rate filing is a compilation of all kinds of data that make up this very long formula that is going to end up with a result, um, product sum, et cetera, of where they feel that the rate needs to be. And in North Carolina, we're broken up by many different territories, and the rate is assigned by territory. And so loss data is included in this rate filing for homeowners insurance it included loss years of 2012, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So what is reflected in this rate filing does not include any losses of 2018, um, does not include any losses from 2017. It is only reflective of those loss years of 2012 through 2016. So keep that in mind. Um, if you are thinking that, wait a minute, we just went through this, um, you're absolutely right. <laughs> because um, I was going back through my old press releases and it just so happens that on November 20th, 2017, the North Carolina Rate Bureau asks for 18.7% rate hike for homeowners insurance. That rate hike in the press release, um, just as the press release that was done December 21st, 2018, of which you have a copy of, uh, that increase at that time, the uh, Department of Insurance issues the press release based on an overall statewide average request for a rate increase or a decrease, and typically it's an increase and not a decrease. Um, so in November 20th, 2017, right before Thanksgiving, <laughs> we were hit with a rate filing. Um, we sent out information, calls for action, hey, we need to comment. The, um, the deadline to comment was, interestingly enough, uh, December 29th of 2017. The public comment session was held uh, on December 12th of 2017. At that time, I was one of four people that spoke at that public comment because December 12th, people are doing a whole lot of other things than worrying about a homeowner's insurance rate filing and driving to Raleigh to attend a public comment forum. So this time with having this forum, um, hopefully we'll see some more people in Raleigh and um, even more people commenting. The, um, <clears throat> the rates that were considered at that time uh, in 2017 in that 2000 page plus filing the insurance commissioner reviewed that filing, or I'm sorry, his staff actually reviews the filing. There is then a determination made whether or not that rate filing is going to move forward. Um, is the insurance commissioner going to do nothing? If the insurance commissioner does nothing, then the request for the rate changes become effective based on what um, the rate bureau asked for. Uh, and then he could also uh, deny the filing altogether, in which he did at that time, he did deny the filing. And he said, we're going to call for hearing. However, um, a settlement agreement was reached with the Rate Bureau on that November 2017 homeowner's insurance filing. And it's very interesting, and please take note of this, because we will touch on this um, in just a few more minutes. But um, he negotiated a statewide average homeowner's insurance rate increase of 4.8% and a 12% increase cap um, at that time on tenants and condo insurance rates. Uh, Darren Currituck County homeowner and wind-only insurance policyholders at that time, we were only supposed to see a 5.5% increase when the rates become effective October 1 of 2018. These rate changes just went into effect in October of 2018. November, December, January, February. That's only four and a half months ago that new rates went into effect. And so, therefore, if anyone has a renewal after today, you haven't even seen the impact of the rate increases that just went into effect in October. So and that was from the last homeowner's insurance rate filing. And then we got hit with, um, for those folks that have dwelling policies, 
dwelling policies um, separate from your homeowner's policies in that uh, the dwelling policies, when I say what's the difference between homeowner's rate filing and a dwelling rate filing, um, there are many different types of homeowner's policies. So you'll see HO4, HO5, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a dwelling policy typically has less coverage. You don't have liability coverage, am I correct, Jackie? Um, through a dwelling policy. Dwelling policies typ typically cover second homes, those that are not owner-occupied. If you have a year-round rental, um, if you have a vacation rental home, those are typically covered by dwelling policies. So keep that in mind. This homeowner policy does not, this homeowner um, rate filing does not affect dwelling policies. It will affect your fire liability policy. If you have a separate wind policy, it certainly impacts that. Uh, if you have condo um, insurance or tenants insurance, this homeowner rate filing will um, impact that. So how are the rates established? Wind rates, et cetera. Um, rates, you go through the filing, there's a lot of pages, 2,000 some pages, and um, you're not meant to understand it, I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> when I started all this research about 10 years ago, the only thing I knew about homeowner's insurance was looking at my bill and seeing how much is the premium and when is it due. Um, how many of you are, are, are in that same boat? How much is the premium and when is it due? And then you say, oh my gosh, this seems a little odd. How did my premium, I'm pretty sure this is not what I paid last year. How many of you actually go back and reference your premium from last year? Ah, good. We're paying attention. We're paying attention. Um, this is kind of what it looks like on this page. There's a lot of numbers of which you have no idea what they correspond to, but I'm going to show you. Um, there's uh, what the indicated rate is, what the filed rate is, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's formulas that you go through, um, lots of charts, lots of testimony. Um, this is only one small snippet of the 2,000-some um, pages that, that make up that rate filing. And so um, there's a formula. And there's general statute that says how we are supposed to set rates or how the um, Department of Insurance is supposed to set rates. Um, and then you probably ask, well, wait a minute. You just said rates don't go into effect until October 1, 2018. And that was from a 2017 filing. It seems like every year my insurance keeps going up. How many of you are in that boat? How many of you get a premium every year and notice like, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on? How many phone calls do you think I get from folks that's like, I just got hit with a premium increase of 40%. I thought the rates, like we were supposed to get a decrease. Um, actually, in 2015, there was a full hearing held on a rate filing. Uh, it was the first time since 1993 that a homeowner insurance rate filing had been fully scrutinized by the Department of Insurance, where like a trial was held on a homeowner insurance rate filing. And the outcome of that trial was we were vindicated for all of those that worked tirelessly in trying to put forth the message that we felt that the rates were unfairly discriminatory, that they were unfair, that the wide rate disparity between us and those inland and in the western part of the state was unjustified and unwarranted. We were vindicated because what came out of that trial was that we should have seen an 18% decrease in homeowners insurance rates. And what happened was there was some negotiating and um, therefore we did, we saw a slight decrease and, and that's reflected in the chart that you have in there. Um, whether or not you saw that decrease, I have no idea because there's this little loophole that uh, underwriters can use and that's called consent to rate and consent to rate if you had signed off on a piece of paper that said, do you give us consent to rate your policy? And right now it shows that we might be 1%, 2% above the rate that is the manual rate, maximum rate that can be charged by the Department of Insurance. If we, we can deviate from that rate, and this little loophole says that we can go up 250% above that. And once you sign that piece of paper, guess what? You don't sign it again at a renewal. It stays in effect for as long as you're with that company. And so you're seeing these increases and you're wondering, well, why is my insurance going up so much? Well, you've likely signed a consent to rate form. And just an update on that. Uh, a law that just passed last year that went into effect January 1 of this year, you no longer have to sign that consent to rate form in order for them to go ahead and charge above the rate determined by the Department of Insurance. 
the language in that bill that was passed says that by not requiring the underwriter, the insurance company to make you sign a piece of paper for them to charge over and above, um, as long as payment is made, that's consent, but it is supposed to be somewhere in your policy in bold, I think 14 point font that says we are charging this. This is what you should be charged by the Department of Insurance or the Department of Insurance would be charging you, but we are charging you this. You have to look through your policy. It is due diligence on the policyholders part to understand this. You have to call and ask questions. And I will tell you this, the folks here that work in insurance on the local level are feeling your pain because they live here too. And it's not their decision, it's up here, it's corporate decision. So folks that we have working for us, um, Jackie Chum with the lead insurance, Stephen Gillis with State Farm, and Steve Bondi, partners of us, partners of ours with the Outer Banks Association of Realtors. They're there, they're agents working on your behalf and you just have to keep the lines of communication and say, hey, what's going on? And so we also have an issue with the premiums going up year after year because of inflation rate factors that are applied to your policy. Um, your premium is always going to go up pretty much. It's a given. Yes. So when you renew, if you signed it in the past, it, it holds for posterity. Correct. Can you remove that consent? You can shop around. You can shop around. You can call your agent and say, I'm really questioning this and see what response you get. Because in questioning it, I have heard from policyholders that they have pulled back from the consent or um, negotiated a different premium. So you have to keep in contact with your agent and communicate. And, um, and don't be afraid. I mean, I feel like we almost have to issue um, some type of magnet or something. I know people have stainless steel refrigerators and those magnets don't work anymore, darn it. But just to say, hey, this is when my insurance renewal is. I might want to just contact um, my insurance company to see how much my premium is this year. Keep note of what it was last year and and call and shop around. Because what happens with this new law is how many of us have our um, insurance escrowed? If we have a mortgage, it's escrowed. And once that mortgage company pays that insurance, then you're kind of there. But at any time, you can go back and say, no. I'm going with a different carrier and you can um, get a refund on that policy and whatnot. So you always have the power at, of the policyholder to be in control of what you are paying because that insurance um, premium that you pay is like a one-year contract with the insurance carrier to cover that structure for that year. That structure should only be valued at the rebuild cost for that year. And what happens with these inflation rate factors of which I've seen some companies inflation rate factors go as high as 10% in one year, where you start out at $100,000 is what it's going to cost to rebuild my structure, not your land, it's not the market value, it's the rebuild value of your home, the rebuild value of the structure. And so what happens is, year one, you came in at $100,000, they did all of the, all of the, um, uh, entered into the software, what exactly it would cost to rebuild your structure if it burned down. So say that. And next year, you get your premium and it's based on 110,000. They applied 10%. Now it's $110,000 to rebuild your house after year one and year two. In year um, three, um, second time, third time renewal, it's now 121,000. And you can see by year four and year five, you're kind of skewed when it comes to, now it's something like 150 some thousand when really it's only probably $110,000 to rebuild and what happens in that case is, is you're not paying attention and the company is applying more than, say, a 4%, 3% higher than that kind of inflation rate factor, then your deductible, if you have a 1% name storm deductible, is based on that dwelling value. So you went from $1,000 on $100,000 to now you're over $150,000, so that's $1,500. Just by knowing that, I just saved you $400 if you have a loss. So you have to you have to understand your policy. You have to be an empowered policyholder um, through the North, through the Outer Banks Association of Realtors. It's interesting that kind of our <clears throat> mantra this year is inform and engage, engage and inform. The more informed you are, what do they say? Knowledge is power. So we have to educate our policyholders. We have to be informed. We have to engage um, and communicate um, when it comes to I mean hundreds of dollars. That's what if it's a two hundred thousand dollar house and it's two twenty and then it's two forty. And then now you're looking at, 
at a, a very wide range when it comes to what you're going to pay out of pocket, what you're paying in premium, and um, and we need to keep up with that. We need to know. Yes. What if, okay, so take your example, and we got it for two hundred thousand. Four years later, it's two hundred forty, and then the whole place burns down or something, and the adjuster says it's only going to cost two hundred twenty to rebuild. That happens every day. That's what I thought. You don't get a check for two hundred forty thousand. Homeowner's insurance is not life insurance. You don't, it's not 240, you're gonna give me a check for 240, right? My house burned down, so it might. And then you've got all these other lines of coverage, you know, loss of use, you've got other structures. Um, they don't really matter, they're just a percentage of that total dwelling value. So you really need to be aware of what that dwelling value is and ensure that that number is accurate within that year. And next year, review it again, because Building costs do change. We do know that the cost of lumber just went way up. Builders have had, you know, an issue where they've quoted um, building a structure and then all of a sudden because of tariffs and whatnot, um, uh, the cost of lumber went up. So costs do change. Also, if you have a homeowner policy, you should have with replacement um, value coverage built in like a factor of 25% over and above. So 25% over and above what that value is if there's demand surge if there's an issue if we have a hurricane and we have you know devastation here that there's built into that policy and this is something you need to communicate with your agent about as well um it's better to know ahead of time than after the fact and so having that conversation you know do i have that kind of um, replacement cost value do i have that where um there's a built-in 25 percent over and above what my coverage says it is if we have you know a major disaster so um keep those things in mind that's why your premiums keep going up year after year without a change in the rates yes this is a, a separate point my car insurance just renewed and i had a consent to rate notice on my collision premiums mm -hmm. really down. yes <laughs> yes consent to rate can be uh, issued for any line of coverage yes can they deny you insurance if you refuse to sign the consent rate? Yes, they can. And let's keep in mind, insurance companies are businesses. And they, it is not a public utility. They are businesses. And so they're going to make decisions based on, well, if your roof is more than 20 years old, they're not going to cover you. Um, things like that. They can, it is, it is entirely up to that business how they want to, it is not required by law that they have to offer you coverage. Now, in North Carolina, uh, some of you are familiar with the beach plan, which is supposed to be called the Coastal Property Insurance Pool, which was pretty much set up to offer um, dwelling policies for the, on the ocean front when no other company would write them 20 years ago, whatever. Um, the, uh, and the beach plan or the NC... IUA, North Carolina Insurance Underwriters Association, expanded with the Beach Plan Fair Plan to then it cover not only just dwelling policies, but then wind policies, wind only policies. And so when we're looking at wind rates, you could not get a wind only policy anywhere except in the NCIUA. Now, due to some legislation that passed and some um, efforts on our behalf and trying to advocate for um, more competition, um, competition is good because typically it will cause, you know, a better market and you have um, options. The, um, the legislation that was passed to allow companies to write and come in here and write wind only policies also added in kind of a factor that um, is a multiplier on the rate for the wind portion of the rate. So actually, we kind of got hit with a little bit more rate for wind only policies, but there's competition. And I found that some of those companies that are offering wind only policies outside of the NCIUA, they are now offering full coverage as well. And you can find um, a better deal if you shop around. So let's get to the next slide. Sure. Would you mind if I point out one thing? Also, some of those companies are writing flood insurance policies through the National Flood Insurance Program. Mm -hmm. So if you have a hurricane, what's covered? Is it flood? Is it wind? If you have that with the same carrier, there's not going to be any finger pointing or delaying your claim because they're going to be on it. So I highly recommend trying to combine those um, companies for those policies if you can. It makes it easier at the same time. 
And if you didn't hear, combining your policies, if you find a carrier that can also write flood coverage as well as your wind and homeowner coverage, all the better for you because then they're not pointing fingers of, oh, this is a flood claim, not a wind claim. Um, and we've had that happen in the past where um, through the National Flood Insurance Program, the company is saying no flood, flood insurance program has to pay for it. And, um, and anyway, the other company is saying, no, 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 no. It's flood claim. So <clears throat> let's go to the next slide. Here are the method, the method of rate making, North Carolina General Statute, uh, Chapter 58, Factors to be considered when determining why we need a 30% increase. Rates shall not be, or lost costs, shall not be excessive. They shall not be excessive. Um, they shall not be inadequate. They shall not be unfairly discriminatory. Consideration should be given to the experience of property insurance, which is the most recent five-year period, which is available. And in this particular instance, it's 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, those years. Modeled hurricane losses. And in the past, when they would submit a rate filing, they would use one hurricane model in order to determine. And guess which one out of the few hundred that were ran that they would use. So um, the legislation was passed that says it is mandatory that they use more than one hurricane model in determining um, modeled hurricane losses. And due consideration shall also be given to a reasonable margin, reasonable margin for underwriting profit and to contingencies. So this is all part of what makes up that long formula when it comes to determining how did they come up with the need for a 30% increase. Well, now I'm going to make it just a little more interesting. I am going to just review real quick. Um, in your little packet that was on your chair, the North Carolina Rate Bureau is requesting, and um, this should be a 17.4% actual um, increase. You have the uh, you have the actual press release that was done December 21st right here. This is what's part of it. If you see at the bottom, full press release, 12-21-2018. The North Carolina Rate Bureau asked for 17.4% rate increase for homeowners insurance. This came out at about 4 o'clock on a Thursday. And um, due to some friends that I have in the Department of Insurance, I wasn't looking at the Department of Insurance page on their press release page to try to find this on December 21st. I had other things on my mind. Um, the uh, it came out on a Thursday. Uh, I said, I'm not spending my holiday vacation and my holiday worrying about this rate filing. I was able to pull the pieces together and get something out um, to folks to let them know that this had occurred. Uh, it says that they attest that the increase is needed to cover increased losses, hurricane losses, and the net cost of reinsurance. And I bet if I go back for the last five press releases that were done, it says the exact same thing. Um, the average overall 17.4% rate increase for homeowners insurance. This is a compilation and again, an average statewide. So some places in the state, there's, there's actually a decrease. Some are having lower increases. And then of course, the 30% increase that is requested here. Uh, <clears throat> public comment period is required by law. Do you know why it's now required by law? Because you were heard. You were heard in 2009 when they were looking at legislation and considering, um, I think, three or four different pieces of legislation that said, OK, in 2008, there was a double digit increase here on the Outer Banks and elsewhere along the coast of North Carolina the third time in six years. There was a rate filing that was submitted. I think it was the end of um, October and end of November, same as this. And it was approved in 10 days. <clears throat> with the insurance commissioner at that time leaving office and a new insurance commissioner taking office. And thinking that at that time nobody was paying attention, well, people started paying attention when three times in six years, all of a sudden, this was done in a matter of 10 days. You mean to tell me the Department of Insurance reviewed a very lengthy document over 1,200 pages in 10 days. So in 2009, there was a lot of effort that came from the Outer Banks to try to make the process more fair and more transparent. And Insurance Commissioner Wayne Goodwin at the time, um, in working with legislators in meetings after meetings, um, it is now mandatory that a public comment forum will be held. Public comment period is required by law. Um, the public comment forum will be held this year um, in just a couple of weeks on February 26th, starting at 10 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. in the Department of Insurance building, um, the Albemarle building which is 
conveniently now right next to a parking lot. Yes, <laughs> you don't have to go across that street. And um, written comment, email comments um, should be sent by February 26th, and the email address is right there. So we're going to we're going to go over those public comments and whatnot here in a minute. But if you notice what's missing from this press release, um, does anybody know what's missing? It says the rapier is requested. Here's this. You need to comment. So public comment periods required. Three ways to provide comment. Where's the rate filing? There's no link to the rate filing in this press release. There is no chart. There is no map. So um, Willow Kelly, the Outer Banks Association of Realtors, has provided for you <laughs> a, um, a chart showing rate history. We're going to go over here in a minute what that rate filing actually looks like and its impact to us. But before I go into that, there's some exciting news because there's an indicated rate change and there is a filed rate change. There's a difference. And the indicated rate in a rate filing is based on all the data in the filing. So you're doing um, a paper for school and you're doing research and you're coming up with this and you're going through your thesis and you're doing this and, and you're compiling all the data in the document and then you come up with your summary. Well, the indicated rate is the result of all of that data and all of that research and here's your synopsis and your summary, here's, here's the conclusion. Well, the conclusion of this rate filing says that here on the Outer Banks, our rates need to go up 94% to be fair, to provide reasonable profit, to not be excessive. That's what is shown in the rate filing. So why do you think we're seeing this every two years? Because they're saying, and they said it two years ago, we need you to see an increase of almost double on our homeowners insurance. So you want to talk about the affordability of housing? When now you're you're paying a thousand dollars a month, and and let's not even talk about what happened with the flood insurance program if you're required to have flood, and how the NFIP is you know in disarray and their rating structure is changing and um, it's that was crazy when I saw that. So the North Carolina Rate Bureau has been very generous and recognizes that if you were hit with a 94% increase, it would be very burdensome. And so within the filing, they have stated that they're gonna cap the filed rate to 30% in this rate filing. So it actually shows on the beach areas, which is um, here in, uh, this isn't the entire beach area, the mainland, Currituck mainland, we pretty much know where that's at. Mainland, Dare County, East Lake, um, Mania, that's mainland, actual Dare County. The indicated rate increase for those areas was 34.1%, and they're capping it at, at the, I think, 25%, which is actually in the file. So, I told you you had 10 years of research. You have 10 years of research in your packet. Rate history. What we found out after that 10-day review of a rate filing in 2008 was that we started trying to get data, trying to get numbers. Um, we wanted to ensure that the argument that we feel that we were being overcharged and this was unfair, you know, held water. That are we really, you know, paying our, are we paying more than our fair share? The rest of the state, West 95, felt that they were subsidizing our insurance. Um, they, uh, you know, there was this, you know, coast versus inland kind of argument that, you know, we have to pay more because of those losses on the coast. And we started doing our homework and <clears throat> compiled this information of rate history. Now, territories have changed since 2009. The city of Charlotte used to stand alone. We found out in 2009, of which we shared with our letter legislators, the information that 32 counties at that time and the city of Charlotte had not even seen a rate increase in almost 20 years. And in some instances, we're paying less. So um, they couldn't believe it. Out of 100 counties in North Carolina, what do you mean that these areas have never seen a rate increase? And their premiums were kind of going up too, but not because of any rate changes. So um, in talking to lobbyists and whatnot, they're like, well, we can't get rate increases in these areas. We can only get them on the coast. So we're going to take what we can get. And we're just like, no, wait a minute. We're kind of skewed here. And when we were looking at just wind rates, our wind rates, the wind portion of the, the full homeowner rate was 10 times what it was in another area of the state that has an overlay from NOAA wind zone, like high wind zone. Um, 
High minor rate was like five times as much. And we are surrounded by water. Flood insurance has no play in this at all. So this doesn't even, even include any type of flood losses. So when you look at the rate history, which is your nice little two-page chart here, um, the mainland areas of Currituck, Dare, and Hyde are referred to as coastal areas. And then the coastal areas are referred to as beach areas. So it doesn't mean you're right on the beach. It just means you're on that barrier island portion. Um, and so the coastal areas are actually your mainland areas, just to clarify on the chart, and your beach areas are actually the barrier island portion of um, those counties. So you can see where we started. Um, and these have all been revised to reflect, I think in 1993, 98, 2002, um, coverage was based, uh, rate was based on $75,000 worth of coverage. Then it went up to, I believe, 150. We're now per $200,000 worth of insurance with a $1,000 deductible. Uh, you know that you can negotiate deductibles with your carrier. A lot of folks just in order to afford their homeowner insurance or flood insurance are going to $5,000 deductibles. I think uh, Congress passed where the flood insurance program, you go to $10,000 deductible. So at the end of the day, you're wondering, well, if I never have a claim, then um, by the time I pay out of pocket and what I paid for the premium, oh my gosh. So um, let me show you what this means to Outer Banks policyholders because I sh I'm giving you rate history up through the October 1, 2018 effective date for homeowner insurance. This was the um, rate increases that were settled on, the 5.5%. What the wind portion of that rate is, if you can see for the beach areas, the um, there on the barrier island portion of Currituck, Dare, and Hyde, effective in 2018, $2,383 for $200,000 worth of coverage. Um, that was a 5.5% increase of which you'll be seeing October 1, might be seeing more based on that consent rate or your inflation rate factor. The win portion of that rate is $1,826. So for fire and liability, you're looking at, what, 400, 400 and some dollars, um, almost 500. So the win portion of the rate is critical. And if you have a separate wind only policy, you're being, there's, there's, there's an extra added charge, and if you're in the beach plan, you get that, and then you get surcharged an extra 5%. Your market of last resort, the beach plan that will always be there to write your coverage, you get surcharged for going there. And the General Assembly was told, well, we need to surcharge them to keep them from going there. And our argument at the time was, well, we have nowhere to go. We're backed into a corner, and we have nowhere to go to find a win-only policy. And at the time, I think it was State Farm Farm Bureau, um, some of the other companies decided at the time that they were just dumping all of their policies. The win portion of the policy was just going to the beach plan. Um, I am happy to report that due to competition, the beach plan has come depopulated somewhat. They did suffer some big losses last year. They had almost $2 billion in cash reserves and premiums coming in. Um, I looked at their financials um, yesterday and there was huge payouts last year. But they have reduced their reliance on reinsurance. And I'm going to give a little shout out to Gina Schwitzgable, the manager of the NCIUA. NCJUA has done a tremendous job in running that operation. It is a model to manage catastrophic risk um, for other states and I think the country in that she has trimmed expenses. She has where we had reinsurance costs. And for those of you that might not be familiar, how many of you have a business that you can have another business that backs up your business? <laughs> that's kind of what reinsurance is. We're in the business of insurance. We can buy this reinsurance that's going to cover what we're in business for. And that's covering risk. So we can buy this reinsurance product. Um, and she's reduced her reliance on reinsurance, which built up cash reserves to the extent that the premium dollar that we were paying in the beach plan for wind only policy, almost 70% of it was going to buy reinsurance. It's now less than 20%. That is huge. So all that extra in the good years went to build up a cash reserve. That kind of makes sense. You build up the rainy day fund for when you have a rainy day. So um, some good information just to look at. I'm a numbers person. To me, this is pretty exciting. And um, the homeowners uh, territories, I did not include this. But the map, you've got the definition of the map and what territories it is, but um, the map was changed in 2015. You can find it on the Department of Insurance's site. It's kind of hard, but um, it's there. But here's the territory map of all of the territories um, in North Carolina. 
So what does this mean to us? What does it mean to Outer Banks policyholders and those in Eastern North Carolina? Here's what we're looking at for um, an effective date. If nothing happens, if the insurance commissioner does absolutely nothing, these rates become effective within a certain time period, October 1, 2019, you're gonna see a 30% increase on the barrier island portion of Currituck Dare and Hyde County. 30% uh, will take you to the 2383. Um, our, our current rate of 2383, the filed rate, which will become effective October 1, will be $3,098. Um, again, that's not indicative of surcharges on wind policies. This could be even more than that. Um, if you look at the coastal areas, which is the mainland portion of Currituck, Deer Hyde, and Pamlico counties, a 25% increase is being proposed. Current rate 1516, you're looking at almost 1900. Um, and that is for full homeowner, fire liability, and wind. If you had a separate wind policy, you're probably looking at more than that. And also, if you're already above that, and based on that inflation rate factor and consent to rate, there's other variables there. So there's a breakdown of what it means for us based on $200,000 of dwelling rebuild value, cover J, $1,000 deductible. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to, in the beginning of this presentation, inform, engage. Third one, we need to act. We need to act. It is listed in your press release. And you, I can't read that from here. I can probably read it right from here and this paper that I have. But there will be a public comment forum, which will be held uh, on the increase at the North Carolina Department of Insurance um, second floor hearing room in the Albemarle Building. Uh, on Salisbury Street on February 26th from 10 a.m. to 4.30. I think we need to be contacting um, Chairman Bob Woodard and um, maybe some town officials to see if we can't get a caravan to go to rally on that day and let our voice be heard. And if you cannot make it that day, um, please email a comment to 2018homeowners at ncdoi.gov. And anyone you know, that has an email address needs to email 2018 homeowners at ncdoi.gov. We were very successful in our, our efforts in the past of which that first public comment forum that was held, we had a few thousand signatures, a few thousand comments that were sent in through email. Um, I think the last one we got close to 10,000. So we need to spread the word, send it to your friends, anybody that owns property uh, as a homeowner um, that you know of in North Carolina needs to send a comment and i'm making it easy for you because also in your packet <laughs> there is a sheet that um, gives you the information to get started and you have an information that says talking points and there's the email address 2018 homeowners at ncdoi.gov please express to the department of insurance that the proposed rate increases they are excessive they are unwarranted and they are unfairly discriminatory. There's another side argument going on about those that are paying through consent to rate and no longer signing to have that done. Um, isn't consent to rate basically an excessive rate? And now you don't have to sign anymore? Find me an attorney. Um, the filing impacts the affordability of housing and the ability of a policyholder to make their mortgage payments. While they don't wanna hear you complain that, oh, we just don't wanna pay more, there is justification in this rate filing that these rates are not warranted. This does affect families that live in our year-round neighborhoods. Please review this and scrutinize this filing to the greatest extent possible. The filing does not include the number of policyholders or amounts charged over the manual rate under consent to rate. The Department of Insurance has said they could not get the data from the underwriters, the insurance carriers. Therefore, with this deal that was made in this legislation that went into effect January 1st, in that now you don't have to sign, now the company has to provide the information as to where they're using consent to rate and how much. So um, hopefully through this year, we'll see exactly where consent to rate is being used. Um, the increase in homeowners insurance rate um, we mentioned that it affects year-round resident policyholders, wind-only policyholders. It affects condo and renter policyholders. For those that um, do not own their home but are renting, um, this is going to impact you if you have a renter policy. Rate increases just went into effect October 1. We're not even five months in October 1. There's not been enough time to thoroughly evaluate the adequacy 
of the newly effective rate increases. And they had mentioned in this filing that it does, does um, include current rate. How could they analyze the impact if the rates haven't even gone into effect? And, and so it, this just makes no sense to me. I mean, that is the greatest argument right there. How can you look at a rate filing when you don't even know the impact of what has yet to be charged? Um, no filing should be considered until the North Carolina Department of Insurance has clear knowledge of how many policyholders are paying premiums based on consent to rate and how much over and above the manual rate has been charged. If we go back to a couple slides and we look at that um, factors to be considered. Consent to rate bypasses the entire rate making process. It means that they can charge you whatever they feel needs to be charged to ensure profit. And so it doesn't have to be um, explained. There's no oversight. There's, there's no, uh, the Department of Insurance does not have to say, okay, you can do that. If the rate shall not be, or loss cost shall not be excessive, it would seem that if the Department of Insurance has looked at a rate filing and said, there should only be a five and a half percent increase and they go above that, it would seem to me that that would be excessive in my thinking. Agree? Mm -hmm. Agree. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And I think that here looking at the coast, given the fact that our rate is so high anyway, mm -hmm. to get a little bit more of that, our five percent increase is this. Right. 5% increase in Raleigh is this, 20% is this, 20% there is this. So um, we need to be heard and you need to keep this in mind, share it with everyone you know, email today, 2018homeowners at ncdoi.gov. I sent the email, I wanted to be the first one. So <laughs> when I got it, before I shared it with anybody, I sent an email to that and I'm gonna call and see, you know, how did I get, was I first, was I first? Um, so that's pretty much my presentation. I do want to um, just let you know a couple things. Uh, we have someone here in the, the audience, my legislative chair, our legislative chair with the Outer Ranks um, Association of Realtors. I never said it's in mine. Our legislative chair, Ms. Kim Andre, is here. And um, through the North Carolina Association of Realtors, they have um, an entity called the North Carolina Homeowners Alliance. And they've been going across the state, setting up at fairs and whatnot and um, different events and gathering emails from homeowners to um, have them in a database to let them know if something comes up regarding legislation impacting private property rights, impacting you as a homeowner. They want you to be involved, engaged, and informed, and therefore, she's got some cards back there on the way out. She'll be here to um, let you know how to sign up. Also, through the Outer Banks Association of Realtors, we are in discussion right now with the state association to form a local chapter. Um, long overdue here that we have an Outer Banks homeowners alliance because what we are doing um, through the Outer Banks Association of Realtors, what we did with the Outer Banks Home Builders Association, advocating for private property rights, affordable and fair um, property insurance, it impacts not only those members of those two associations, but our property owners and homeowners here, everyone, all homeowners. So um, that homeowners alliance will give us more access to keep you informed. Um, through the association, we have been publishing a legislative briefing every week. We had a more knowledgeable membership than anyone else in the state when it came to what was happening in our towns. He saw me at meetings. Brian, when he was a councilman, and so saw me at meetings. Um, and so we all need to be a part of that and to stay um, informed and engaged. And so my business card is on the back with my email address and cell phone number. Be sure to pick that up. Um, hopefully by the end of this year, we can kick off that um Homeowners Alliance, and I would like to open it up. I know we said we'd be here 7 to 8.30. The League of Women Voters, phenomenal partnership. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to, to be here and to share. And um, I know Michelle uh, Clark is in the audience. She's a, a board member of the association. And we've got a few others 
here that are involved as well as Kim. Jackie um, is a great partner um, with Elite Insurance, like I said, Stephen Gillis, and we have um, Steve Bonde with Bankers Insurance. So we have great resources here to help people get the best possible deal that you can get with good coverage. Um, there are deals out there, and you might find that the coverage is not what you thought it was um, when you have a claim. So we want everyone to be prepared. One other quick note, flood maps. Flood insurance. We weren't going to talk about that, but I am going to say just one thing. Um, Dare County flood maps. Although we've seen the data for years, um, hopefully uh, we will get the letter of final determination in April. But with the government shutdown, then I was told maybe not. That's right. We keep hearing this every six months for the past four years. By the time we get the maps, they're going to be old, and then we're going to need new maps. A lot of people are excited about these maps. Old base flood elevations are going down five feet. I'm going to save, you know, I won't be required to have flood insurance. 75% of properties coming out of the flood zone. Okay, this is where I'm just going to say, okay, wake up. What are we surrounded by? <laughs> water. We're surrounded by water. So it would not be prudent of you, even if the base flood elevations have gone down to the extent and you're put in an X zone and you can get a preferred risk policy, do not drop your flood insurance. Promise me the people in this room are going to maintain your flood insurance. You can probably get a better deal by keeping your coverage than actually getting a preferred policy because I can guarantee you in a couple years, New maps are going to come out. They're going to say this is outdated information. New maps are coming out. The base flood elevations are going up. And then if you try to go back to buy a policy brand new, you're going to have you're going to be paying big time. So I don't want to see you um, be insurance um, uh, poor and not be able to stay in your house. So <clears throat> keep your flood insurance. Um, um, the county and the towns have been working on local elevation standards that will be higher than these standards shown on the maps anyway. So um, just my two cents working since I had your attention. I thought I'd take advantage of it. So does anybody have any questions? What are you going to do when you go home tonight? Email. email. That's right. What's that email address? <laughs> yes. 2018 homeowners. That's right. 2018 homeowners at ncdoi.gov. Who has a question? Should you email for each property that you own, or should just one email include all the properties? Because you have multiple. Um, what do they say about voting? Vote early and often. Um, <laughs> let's see. How many uh, email addresses do you have? That's right. How many email? I'm not sure if they will flag your email if um, they say you've already sent sent yeah. one. Um, so, you know, they would flag it based on my. I thought. I thought so. Yes. But isn't that a moot question because the year-round rentals are not covered by this? Um, is what a moot question? If you have more than one property, they're not all You can still property. express your concerns about this because gotcha. actually no, some no, some no, second no. homes are covered by homeowner policies. Mm -hmm. There are some that in working with a really good agent can find you a full replacement cost policy um, with liability coverage through a homeowner policy. So um, there are those out there. Typically, when I said typically, Dwelling policies cover those. Based on your talking points, based on my experience of reviewing comments, don't use them verbatim the way you put them. Yes. Make them a little bit different. Yes. Um, also, a good thing to do too is to change the subject line. Yeah. So when I put in the talking points, um, you know, make sure you put deny the filing. You don't have to use those specific words in the way I spelled HO. You can change it up because they do recognize those just stock template kind of call for action um, emails that come in. Just put aside. Yes. So change the subject line. Um, please deny the filing. Um, we just want to make sure that somewhere in the context of that, um, in the content of that email, you say to deny. Um, deny means he's going to have to call for hearing or set. Negotiate. Yeah. If besides what you're saying, I'd like to go home and review my policies. <laughs> so I want to know what I have. Who would I? Who could I go to that would be nonpartisan, in the sense that I could go to to review my policies and say, what am I doing here? And, you know, I mean, those things are this thick. I who understand. Um, <clears throat> well, my business card is back there. You can call me. <laughs> And, and to be honest, in the last several years, I've probably looked at about 60, 70 policies. And I could pretty much, in looking at the tax record document and um, what was on the policy and where it was, and then in contacting a few people that I know that are involved, say, hey, something here doesn't want to go. And then there's been other instances where I say, yeah, I think they're right on. So, 
All right. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Who else? Come on. <laughs> I just told you how you can save hundreds of dollars. Yeah. Wow. Or thousands. Or thousands even. Millions. We can save money. <laughs> so, so thank you all.